When David was much younger, he lived in Lancaster, California. He spent some time with his girlfriend out at the Dunes on Avenue K and 150th Street East. They were waiting for some friends to meet them, but they never showed up. So around midnight, they decided to head home and on this particular night, it was very dark. And they had heard dogs barking all night, but since the area was filled with coyotes, they didn't think much of it. Now, as they approached the intersection of Avenue K and 150th, David noticed something move against the night sky. And as soon as he saw it, whatever it was turned its head to look at his car. And he knows this because of the eye shine against his headlights. It continued to stare at his car as it crossed the road. They then made the turn westbound on Avenue K, whatever it had been threw him into temporary shock, so much so that when he looked down at the speedometer, he was going 145 miles an hour. He immediately slows down, asks his girlfriend if she had seen what he had seen, and she could only nod her head yes. He dropped her off at her house and drove home. Now, upon arriving, he promptly called the sheriff's department. So, as to not sound like a crazy person right off the bat, David simply asked if a disturbance had been reported in the area of 150th Street East and Avenue K. The deputy asked him for more details about what kind of disturbance this had been, and David didn't really know how to describe it. The deputy was becoming a bit annoyed at his evasiveness and finally asked, what exactly are you asking about? David took a deep breath and began telling the deputy that he wasn't going to believe him and then described exactly what he had seen. Now, without missing a beat, the deputy said, you know, it could have been Bigfoot. Now, at first, David thought he was patronizing him. However, the deputy followed up with, no, really, we've had reports of Bigfoot in the area, and with the drought, everything is coming down out of the mountains. Now, this morning, they just pulled a 400-pound black bear off the 14 freeway. The deputy thanked David for the call, and they hung up. Could it be that the people of this town have accepted that they have Bigfoot roaming nearby? This next story comes from Jameson, who was hesitant to send the story in, but my recent mermaid videos have inspired him to share it with all of us. Now, this encounter occurred during the summer when he was about four or five years old. It took place in Sylvan Beach, New York. It was a typical hot summer day, and Jameson was enjoying some time at the beach with his mother and sister. Now, the beach swimming area was crowded, and people were sunbathing and relaxing under umbrellas. It was a seemingly ordinary day and what you'd expect for a day at the beach. But Jameson was swimming or playing in the shallow waters close to the shore when he heard his mother call to him from afar in the deeper water. Now, for some reason, he got terrified to swim out to her, which was weird because he was a good swimmer and had not had any accidents thus far. However, something on this day was telling him that there would be trouble if he went out there, his gut instinct firing off. He also knew that if he did not do as his mother said, that would not end well. So he came up with the idea of holding onto the rope. There was a roped off area that was supposed to be dangerous to swim in for some reason. And he started by using the rope to go out to her, but knew that eventually the point would come where he would need to let go and swim to her as she wasn't close to the rope. Now, he wasn't gliding on the rope very far before he felt like two hands had grabbed his legs. Now, he starts to fight and try to keep his head above the water, but something told him not to look down at whatever it was. Instead, he looked at the sky and fought to get away. Now, he did his best to hold on to the rope and keep trying to kick his feet to free his own escape, and he lost the rope quickly, but tried to use his hands to help him escape. Now suddenly, whatever was hanging onto his ankles just let go. Unfortunately, by this time, he was already underwater and now sinking rapidly. Just when he thought he wasn't going to make it, he saw a face above him, above the water, looking down at him. The person who appeared out of nowhere, or so it seemed, pulled him up out of the water. 
He thought it was an adult, but was later told it was actually a teenager. He was also later told that he had gotten caught in hay. He thought this unlikely as hay or bales of hay don't have hands to grab you and pull you down. Now, it's easy to dismiss Jameson's encounter because it could be easily perceived that a four or five year old would, of course, not understand the difference, but I think there's more to this. Now, at one point, he was also told it was seaweed and he knew better. It felt like hands and he could feel the force of being dragged down. He can remember everything, including the desperation he felt while staring up at the sky and fighting with everything he had to make it out of the water where he would be able to breathe. Now, predictably, when he was carried ashore, people swarmed. He doesn't remember if there were any marks or scratches on his hands or feet, and no one took him seriously, of course, when he tried to explain that something had grabbed him. But what do you think, though? Is this the overactive imagination of a child who never even participated in an imaginative play, a child confused after nearly dying, a misunderstanding of what was happening when it was just seaweed or hay? Something supernatural, a dangerous prank where no one saw the prankster, or something else. Well, whatever it was that nearly caused him to drown, one thing is true. While he did not get the teen's name, he is sure glad he was there that day. Now, thinking back, he doesn't know how he was able to grab him in time, especially from as far away as it was. It should have been impossible. Now, we're going to go on to talk about some of Jared's experiences. The supernatural seems to follow Jared nearly everywhere he goes. The first incident happened on Christmas Eve 1994. Jared was 12 years old when he had heard children talking outside, and he thought, how nice is it to hear kids talking and enjoying Christmas Eve? But shouldn't children be waiting for Santa at this hour? He decides to walk outside to take a look, but nobody was there, and there was no footprints anywhere in the snow. So he shrugs it off, and for a few years, he just felt odd about it. Now. It wasn't until March of 98 that things began getting weird. I'm talking Portland weird. He was sitting on the couch watching Married with Children at 11.30 p.m. and everything was fairly normal. All of his family was asleep, including his sister who was sleeping in her room and all of the pets were asleep. Now suddenly, Jared hears this maniacal laughter <laughs> pouring out from his sister's slightly ajar bedroom door. At first, he thought he was crazy, but then it happened again, and again, it trails off. He jumps off the couch, goes into the kitchen, and grabs two knives. He finally made his way to the parents' bedroom, where he wakes up his father, but his father was simply annoyed. So, Jared was told to go to bed. However, from that point on, strange things wouldn't stop happening. TVs would turn on and off. Things could be heard moving and shuffling around and faucets turning off and on by themselves. The subsequent two serious incident happened in 2000 and 2002. The most significant one occurred when five people were present. Jared, his sister, and a few friends had decided to go out and buy a large assortment of balloons to fill up his bedroom. There were so many that when they sat down on the floor, they were wholly engulfed in balloons. This was the intended result. Now, the group began flailing their arms, making balloons fly everywhere. They were getting pretty loud, and being awakened was something that upset his parents tremendously. Not caring about this at the time, they continued making noise, when all of a sudden, they all heard someone whisper, SHUT UP! inside of their minds as if it were their own consciousness. The best way Jared can describe it is that it sounded like it was being said in a static metallic tone. Everyone froze and they all stared at one another, confused and also frightened by what had happened. A feeling of dread swept over the entire room. Everyone felt petrified just by the feeling alone at that moment that they all left. As frightening as it was, it was great to finally have three other people experience some strange things that had been happening. The group could not get over that. They had all heard the same creepy whisper over all of the yelling. The next day, Jared asked his parents if they had been awakened and they said they had not heard a peep. 
Now, Jared's next story takes place when he was called to pick up his father when he broke down at work on his mail route. Now, that day, the house seemed to have a silent but cold feeling all day, and he was happy to leave. After walking outside, he turns around to return to the house to get something. But when he did, the feeling inside the house had changed for the worse. Immediately, he felt like he should leave. However, he didn't and instead continued down the hallway. And as he walked down the hallway toward a closet, the closet door blew open and clothes went flying across the hall. He ran like hell back out the front door. Another otherworldly event happened to Jared on a night he stayed over at a friend's place. When he arrived back home around six in the morning, his dad was pissed. And when Jared asks him why he is mad, his dad says, and I quote, that damn ghost attacked your sister last night and you should have been here. Jared asked his sister what had happened and this is what she said. She was talking on the phone and began to feel the dread building up. So she wanted to get into the room and close the door, but she had to get ready for bed first. And as she was doing this, a stack of folded laundry was sitting neatly on a chair and she could see the chair from the bathroom. Now suddenly, she noticed movement and watched the entire stack of towels fell off the chair. Perturbed but not yet fearful, she proceeded to restack the laundry and then continued getting ready for bed. Now apparently this ghost must hate clean laundry or must be a messy person. The dread intensified and she watched as more towels fell, but this time with more than enough force to move them a short distance away from the chair. The dread was now intensifying and at the same time, something started pounding on her door so hard she thought it was going to break down. She began screaming and crying in terror. Now this woke her parents up. They would later share that they too heard the commotion. Now another night, not too long after Jared's sister was in her bedroom while he and a friend were watching TV in the den, as they call it, as they were sitting there, Jared begins to hear an odd sound. Then the dread feeling returns. When he investigates more closely, he sees that the sound he just heard was the amp turning itself on, followed by the five disc CD changer, which also turned itself on. It didn't just come on, it also started changing and cycling through the discs. It got to the third disc, started clicking through the tracks, and then started playing I Can't Get No Satisfaction by the Rolling Stones. His dad didn't believe that he hadn't done it. Jared moved out shortly after that. Now, Jared can tie many of his experiences back to electricity. Here's one such story. His front porch typically had two lights, but one of them had burned out at one point, and it was not storming that day, but suddenly, what looked like lightning flashed with a boom, and after it happened, something looked different. Upon examination, Jared heard a weird click and saw that the broken light on the porch had come on all on its own. The light that had burnt out was now shining brightly and the other bulb was out. This could have been a fluke, but the fact that there were no thunderheads, the switch flipped and the burnout light was revived is all strange. Now, Jared's next experience took place on July 24, 2000. He has spent years trying to uncover more information about what he experienced, and over the years, he has discovered that what he witnessed has been going on since at least 1923 in his neighborhood. It was some sort of craft hovering above him. Now, in 1987, this same, or at least similar craft, almost landed on one of the most prominent highways in Pennsylvania, Route 30, which these crafts seem to follow. Now, this road runs right through Chestnut Ridge, which is where he thinks they regularly travel. On this particular evening, he was stargazing, being out in the middle of nowhere. Now, he usually didn't sit out there alone, and tonight was no different. As the group was just standing there, chatting about life or whatever it is they talk about, they suddenly heard this deafening, continuous boom coming from the sky to the west. There was nothing to the west. Above their heads was a 200-foot-long craft that was low enough that you could easily hit it with a rifle. It was just hovering in silence over their heads. The guy with him then says, 
are we really seeing that? And Jared thought, so that's what it is. Now, before this evening, he had seen this thing at least 10 times flying extremely high into the blue until it disappeared. He thought it was a blimp and was impressed that they had made a blimp that could handle those air pressures and altitudes. This night, however, confirmed that it wasn't a blimp. It was a cigar-shaped craft, a craft size and shape commonly seen by many other UFO sightings, with three red lights pulsating slowly on each side. He ran to get a camera, but this was 2000. They only had a 1989 camcorder that needed to be plugged into operate. Instead, he grabbed some binoculars because he wanted to see this thing. And as he continued to watch this, the sound kept getting louder and he could now see five Harrier type jets in a V formation following it. The weirdest part was they seemed like they were moving in slow motion, but they couldn't have been as their afterburners were all on. Now, the following day, he found himself up early. After all, it was hard to sleep after seeing something like that. A friend of his had stayed over after what they had witnessed the night before. That's a good friend. Since they were both up early, Jer drove his friend home, and as his friend was getting out of the car, he said, We really saw that last night, didn't we? Jared was still so dumbfounded and shocked by the entire experience, he doesn't recall his response. He does, however, remember that immediately upon returning home, he jumped online to look for any information regarding what he had seen. He is convinced that it was a secret government craft. I mean, why else would five jets be following it? The next experience Jared shared took place one night in August of 1998. A neighborhood friend of his came to his window in the middle of the night, knocked on it, and asked if he could come out and just chat with him as he was going through a really rough breakup. Jared agreed to talk to him, and they laid in the driveway and looked up at the stars as they chatted. How romantic. The night was clear, and as Jared was looking at the stars, he saw that two of them appeared to be moving. Then he realized they were not just moving, but they were doing figure eights over and over again. Jared turned to his friend and said, are you seeing that too? His friend replied that he also saw it. His friend, however, was too distraught over his personal life issues that they didn't really stop to talk about what they had seen. Jared can't stop thinking about what he had witnessed and decides that they should plan to do it again on the next full moon in August. Now, on the day they had chosen to watch the sky, Jared was at work when something strange happened. He was working as a farmhand and was on the way to one of the fields when he noticed this lovely little waterfall in a pasture. There was only one road to this field, so he was pretty sure it would be easy to find if he decided to return. Another one of their friends dropped the two guys off nearby. They planned to repeat the other evening. However, as they start down the road, they cannot find the waterfall anywhere. They were never able to locate it, and Jared was so bothered by this that he later went back in the daytime to see where it was. He never found it and was never able to explain why. On another evening, Jared and a friend were walking around a nearby field in the darkness. No flashlights, no phones, nothing. And suddenly, they saw these huge shadows coming towards them. Massive shadows. They were the size of Clydesdales. The young man ran out of the field and headed back toward his parents' house. Now, as they walked past the only house on the road, they heard what sounded like a woman crying for help, and it was really loud. They couldn't see her in any window, but continued to look around and see if she needed help. She continued to cry and beg for help, but when they could not locate her, they figured they should seek help. Now they crossed the intersections and started up a hill. That road only had two trees and apparently a dog somewhere because they kept hearing it bark. Now, the, when the woman stopped crying for help, they began to hear a car's engine, but could see no headlights anywhere. Then, on this winding road, they saw a car with no headlights come creeping down the hill extremely slowly. This car didn't have brake lights either. The car reached the stop sign at the intersection, and four people got out of the car. They appeared to be dressed in black suits and began searching around the vehicle. Jared assumed they were looking for him and his friend, so he told his friend to hug a tree. 
When you hug a tree, it is tough for someone to see you in the darkness. Jared and his friend go undetected, and after about two minutes, the four individuals return to the car. They again begin their trek up the hill just as the car returns from a different direction. The car stops the intersection again, and four people get out. Again, Jared and his friend hide, and after about a minute, the same four get back into the car. At this point, Jared and his friend agree that they need to get home and fast. They decided not to mention the woman crying as they believed her to be otherworldly. Jared's next experience occurred at his ex-wife's parents' house. At some point in the middle of the night, when he could not sleep, he got on the floor to do some push-ups and sit-ups. Because the only light was from his fish tank, he pulls out his phone for a little extra light. And as he did this, he begins to feel dread. When he looked at the phone screen, it dialed eight zeros and hit send on its own. What he heard next coming from the phone's speaker was static and screaming, screaming so loud that it sounded like people were burning alive. He throws the phone across the room and lays awake for the remainder of the night, waiting for the sun to come up. Jared faced something else he could not explain while he was visiting a childhood friend. The friend had just recently bought a home and had moved back to town. Now, this home he had purchased is an old home, built in 1795 and had just recently been remodeled. Now, as Jared was touring the house with his friend and girlfriend, he felt the most intense dread when they reached the staircase. Jared turns to his friend and says, does anything weird ever happen in this house? Immediately, his friend's girlfriend's response, see, he feels it too. Now, nothing more happened that day, but something strange happened one evening in January of 2018. The three of them were visiting when they heard these three huge sounds. It was boom, boom, boom. Jared initially thought it was the furnace. His friend's girlfriend speaks up and says, that hasn't happened in a while. As they all sat there, they suddenly heard it again. Boom, boom, boom. His friends tried to act like the sound was typical and said something like, huh, must have been a truck that passed. Jared remained motionless and terrified over the next few seconds, and the following occurred. Gallons of water began pouring from the ceiling fan. Carry-on beetles started coming out of the ceiling fan. The booms continued in sets of three, sometimes so violently so that things fell off the shelves. The blinds began to aggressively sway, swinging back and forth. No windows were open and a Mountain Dew bottle was thrown at Jared's head, the TV turns on and off on its own. Jared's dog was with them that evening. When this all began, the dog got up on his back legs and began to growl like they had never heard before. It was deep, menacing, and guttural. The dog's hackles were raised, and he starts ducking down behind the back of the couch, quickly popping back up, growled that deep growl, and then repeated it all. The dog did this for a full 30 seconds. Jer knows what the dog is seeing, but doesn't know what to do. And so as he sits frozen, it begins to get even weirder. He looks up to see that hovering above the couch was what looked like a huge black velvet knot in midair that just kept coiling around itself, getting bigger and bigger. Now, at first he thought he must have been hallucinating, but with how the dog was reacting, he know he couldn't be. They say never to show fear to a demon, and so he instead decided to shove his hand into the middle of it. It was the coldest feeling he had ever felt, and the knot dissipated after a few seconds. Jared also encountered Bigfoot. Now, this is his story. It was a starlit night, and he loved to walk around in the woods when the sky was clear at night. Sometimes he even tried to get lost in the woods to see if he could find his way out. A little sadistic, if you ask me. On this particular night, he and his friends John and Dave decided to go into the forest near John's house. The woods seemed extremely dark when they got there because of how open and clear the night sky was. The dread feeling began washing over him again, a feeling that was all too familiar. They walked up the road a bit until they were in front of a house where John's older brother's best friend used to live. 
Jared remembers telling his friends that since they were standing underneath the only streetlight on the road, they were very vulnerable since everyone and everything could see them, but they could not see anything. Just then, Jared heard a chain rattling. He asked John if perhaps this family had a dog and John replied that he didn't think they did. Now, as soon as John had responded, they heard what sounded like someone jumping on a pile of sticks and they quickly began to run. Now, as they were making their way out of the woods, they noticed that all the tree branches were shaking. It appears as though the trees themselves were being rattled. The group consensus was that it had to be Bigfoot. What was stranger was then that when they stopped to listen, the shaking also stopped. And eventually the trees on the side just stopped and the others simply trailed off. Jared prepared for an ambush. Dave checked under the car and they all got in and took off. Jared later found out that the young man who had lived in the home they were standing in front of had died right there on that porch. Now, it's safe to say Jared has had a number of unusual experiences. What do you guys think? Was his house haunted? Was his friend's house haunted? What about his other experiences? Is it just that something supernatural is attached to him and follow him wherever he goes? Whatever the case may be, I want to know your guys' opinions, so please leave them down in the comments below. I want to know. And as always, guys, if you enjoyed today's episode, be sure to go ahead and smack that big ol' red subscribe and like button for more content just like this. I love you all. Keep an open mind, and I'll catch you guys in the very next episode.